Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, we will start in just one minute. Okay, let's get started. Uh, to make sure that everyone can hear me, please, um, in the chat panel, in the right side of uh, the GoToWebinar panel, please write something in the in, in the chat. Say hello, tell me where are you connecting from or something like this so I can know for certain that you can hear me well. You can also uh, click the, the button right hand. So I can see that you are hearing me. Okay, let's move move forward. And let's start with the presentation. Um, before we, we dive in, uh, just some things I wanted to mention. We are recording this webinar, so we will send it to you once we have the video available online. Also, uh, we have mute the audience for quality purposes, uh, but feel free to, to chat or, or to send any questions you have in the in the right panel of the go to webinar so i can pick the question from there uh, at the end of the presentation chris thank you so much for joining us today uh, it's really a pleasure hello hi hi everyone and thank you very much Federico, for inviting me i'm honored to be able to present for your audience and i'm very thrilled to do this yeah Great. Uh, well, I, I will let you, Chris, introduce yourself, but uh, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Federico Toledo. I'm originally from Uruguay. I moved here, uh, I moved to Berkeley, to California, five months ago. I have uh, over uh, 12 years of experience in, in software testing, working for different projects, different uh, customers, different realities, also teaching in testing in different universities. I am very involved in the testing community. And actually, this is how I met Chris for the first time. It was almost four years ago in a conference in Spain called QA Test in Bilbao. And last year, I met him again, um, where I hear for the first time this presentation that I really liked it. So that's how we came up, came up with this idea of uh, sharing the, the content for, uh, 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 for our audience. And I'm really glad we got to do this, Chris. Uh, I also wanted to mention that I, uh, one of the co-founders of Abstracta, which is a company fully dedicated to software testing. Uh, we have been working for customers here, here in the Bay Area in the last years. We have offices in Latin America, in, in, 
uh, United States also and UK. And we have been working for companies like uh, Broadcom, uh, Shutterfly, Verifone, Singularity University, just to mention some of them. If you want to learn more about Abstractor, you can visit our site or reach, a, reach out uh, anytime. So enough, enough about this. Um, I will let uh, Chris to share his slides and his content. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, okay, thank you very much, Federico. Yeah. Uh, shall I go take over now? Okay. Uh, yes. Let me start with a short introduction of myself. Uh, I'm a Dutch consultant. I have over 45 years of experience in IT in many branches, uh, mainly in uh, financial services uh, as a consultant for, a for instance, for CGI, a large Canadian company. Uh, I have more than seven, 27 years in testing and test management and test automation. And currently I'm an independent consultant, uh, giving consultancy to a small company in Amsterdam. Uh, today's presentation is not a technical one. It's about uh, test automation, but looking at it from a uh, strategic angle. So let's go over it. It's about strategy. Uh, and when we look back to the 90s, early 90s, two main, mainly in Holland, uh, defined methods, defined a word called test strategy. Team up next, an, uh, a Dutch uh, test method described as a test strategy, as a chapter, the test plan, with a brief description of the plan test types and indication of the difficulty per crash tactic or sub -tactic. And RRBT, which stands for Risk and Requirement Based Testing, says the test strategy is a document that defines the scope and depth of a test process in relation to the risks that are covered by the test project. These are important things that were mainly used in used in the ancient days of the pre-HLAs. Uh, and what do we need it for? Uh, what did we need it for? And we still do need it for its alignment with the development process. Uh, you want to do the testing activities uh, at the moment that the test development, the process development is ready or almost ready. But you're not testing for yourself. You're also testing for the stakeholders who are the people who are, uh, or the organization parts that are responsible for the use of the system and who take risks for using the system. And from risk, I say uh, product risks, the risks that are connected to the use of a system. What is the damage that is done when a system fails in production? Uh, Next, Testergy says something about the design techniques. How much do you do for a light risk and what do you do for a heavy risk? Or the type of systems like GUI, API, embedded software testing, etc. And of course, the test levels. What type of levels test do you do at what stage of the test development? So that's a test strategy, a predefined set of uh, definition that you use as a guideline during your test process. In age old age, we do not see that much of a test strategy anymore. And I think that's uh, it's, a, it's a shame because I think from the test strategy or the overall strategy of an organization, you will see that uh, things are defined that can be used in the definition of done, for instance. Uh, in a good, proper definition of done, there are things about the quality of the system, uh, how things are tested, and who will test it, etc. And those things like test process requirements, effort per test risk, uh, risk category, or approach, etc., are defined in the definition of done, and those are also defined in the test strategy. So, a test strategy is a document that is on a high level. Uh, in the organization defines the quality level of the, the systems and uh, products that will be delivered by the organization. You can imagine that test, test strategies are uh, different for different departments within an organization. When you look at uh, Philips, for instance, Philips in the Netherlands uh, makes medical systems and they also made, till recently, made light bulbs 
And you can imagine that the risk connected to a medical system like an MRI scanner is far bigger than the risk connected to a light bulb. So there are different types of risk connected to different types of uh, systems. Testing a thing in a test process is connected to the test strategy. Uh, and we see, well, since I was working in testing, that testing is always difficult and always hard to plan and often used as a overflow for development. When we look at this traditional sequential process, uh, first we do planning specification, then we do construction, and then we do tests. And if construction takes too long, we test less. And this even so still in uh, in agile development, we see that still testing is often done at the end of a an, uh, of an sprint. And also in iterative development, we see that testing is done in a, in a, in a, at the end of the sprint. And then if time is up, we do not test as much as we should test. So we should try to remove the test preparation and the testing design from the critical path. And the first step is to start testing, planning a preparation alongside test, uh, planning a specification of the development. Do the test design and specification as early as possible, as soon as you got your first specifications uh, of the development system and try to design and to create the test cases during the construction phase of development so it can do test execution in the end. And if you want to start automating uh, automation of your test execution, you should do this uh, in the same uh, way. So you should start to de define your ar architecture and your environment even uh, before you're planning a preparation of the test. Your test preparation you should do uh, as, as soon as possible as your test cases are defined and your construction of the test automation should be done uh, during your test specification. That means that you really separate the test design and test ex uh, uh, specification from the test automation. And that's an important thing to remember. Test automation is not easy. And what we see is that uh, many organizations start to think that test automation is hot and it should be done and it's important. We tend to, to hire test uh, specialists that are uh, focused on test techniques, test or automation techniques, I should say, not even test techniques, but how to program the test scripts, how to integrate the test scripts into a production code, etc. And there are a number of criteria that you should bear in mind before you start testing automation your test. And these next slides show you the general uh, criteria for test automation. First of all, you should not automate your test if there are only one or two test runs expected. Why? Because test execution is not as fast, but test, test automation preparation is very hard. It takes a lot of time and uh, you need a number of reruns before you break even on your test. So for instance, if you do a lot of uh, regression testing in your uh, process, then test automation comes in, uh, in to be able to do this. So break, break even is the thing that you should calculate. And even this is hard to calculate. I cannot say that I do break even after five runs because it depends on the, the complexity, et cetera, of your system. If you have no user interface, then it might even be easier to uh, automate or uh, the, the, the hurdle to take to automate is lower. And in nowadays, when we do a lot of service-oriented architectures or API uh, architectures and testing on these, we do not have a GUI or other user interface. So we need to uh, communicate with the application, the service or the API via message switching, etc. That makes test automation easier. And you even need to automate it because you cannot uh, test those services in another way. So this case, test automation is important. Complexity of system. If the 
if it's hard to correct an, uh, an error you made during test uh, execution, then it may be a better way to automate it. I've seen systems that we had to enter six or seven screens before we could do one commit and then next uh, find the, the results of the test. If you had an error in the sixth screen, you had to do all the six, uh, six screens again because for, before you could uh, find the, uh, the results. So if the data entry, the manual data entry is uh, error prone and demands for a lot of rework if you do something wrong, in that case, you should of good automate the test. And of course, tooling. Uh, nowadays, there are tools for any type of test uh, that you want to run. Uh, API test, test, surface test, GUI test, code test, code review test, uh, performance test, security test, uh, latency test, whatever you test you have, there are tools. That makes it not very easy. We did For the client I work for right now, we made a list of possible tests tools that are able to do one or any test that you should have, you can have a list of up to 100 test tools, and then you have to choose to, the correct one and not the square one when you do roll some dough. So in the inspecting of investigation in an uh, in an, uh, selection process is very important. And again, it costs money. If your system is not stable and of course in the, the start of your development the systems are not stable or uh, it's very uh, easy to maintain or to change uh, then it's difficult to automate because you need to adhere to the changes that are made to do the application so if i created a large script with a lot of test cases uh, and uh, uh, after one uh, uh, cycle they decided to change the test case, the, the script completely. So I had to change my, my test case as well. Then it is difficult to maintain. The more stable the application is, the better it chances is to automate it. Oops, just want to few too fast, sorry. And of course, the duration of the project. I often heard that people tend or organization tend to say okay we need more uh, time to test we don't have the time so we start automating and that is deemed to fail automation when you have a very short deadline is not advised because uh, like the mythical man month automating cost extra investi investigations extra people extra uh, uncertainties so the that you will not meet the deadline is quite certain if you have not don't have enough time and of, of course you need to train the people uh, the organization i work for currently uh, is training their people in test automation and they get tool training but we also give them a training on, on concepts. So why would you automate your test? How do you automate your test? Uh, when do you automate the test? When do you not automate your test? So focus on the concepts and the application of automation and not on tools. All the tools that I know are more or less the same, focusing on the same principles of automation uh, and learning a language the test language a tool language is not so difficult for an experienced tester so whether he will run tests in uh, soap ui robot framework uh, or whatever tool they will be able to switch to another tool and get familiar with the language it's more important to focus on how you do it why you do it and when you do it so far what I said so far is applicable to any uh, development process that you have, even on non-software development processes. You can imagine that you, if you test non-software things, you have the same approach to defining your test cases, uh, uh, designing your test cases, 
creating your automation scripts, etc., etc. Since we are in the HL world for many years right now, things have changed. And what I found out is still people tend to think in sequential process of, of regression testing, etc. Where in HL you do a lot of retesting over and over in time, again, every sprint. So uh, what I would li like to look at now is how we test and test automate in an HL process. And first I want to step to uh, information uh, defined by Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory, who wrote in their book uh, using the HL test quadrants, uh, how there, that there are four quadrants in a, in a system development in which you can divide uh, any system. The bottom two quadrants in this slide, the Q1 and Q4, are called technology facing quadrants. Uh, and the top two, the Q2 and Q3, are the business facing. And what's the difference? The difference in this is that the bottom two quadrants, the tests are focused on improving the products that the uh, developers make without changing the functionality if they change the system. So the functionality remains unchanged. They try to improve and to be sure that what they make is correct. On the top two, the uh, Q2 and Q3 are business facing. That means if there is something wrong and needs to be changed, then you have to do, there's something to do with the functionality of the system. And what you see is that on the top, the bottom left, the Q1, the unit test and component test are mainly automated. They are easy to automate and they are giving a, a fast feedback to the programmers of the product quality that they are building. The bottom left is also based on this. It will not change the functionality of the system if the performance is not good enough and needs to be improved. The functionality remains unchanged, but uh, the people are able to improve the product. For both Q1 and Q4, there's a lot of automation possible. On Q2 and Q3, the business-facing uh, uh, test case test situations are uh, mainly manual on the right side, which is exploratory testing, and which is uh, scenario testing and usability testing. And on the left side, Q2, there are functional tests and examples. And there is where automation and manual testing comes in. And I prefer a situation that you can do first a manual test and automate this test without changing any of the test cases. So this is the HL test quadrants, which is often used in HL development and HL strategies. You can define your test automation strategy based on this uh, this. Quadrants. Another person who created an, in a modern and well-known uh, figure is this one, this Mike Cohn, who made the test uh, triangle. And he divided the test triangle in a few layers. The bottom layer is the unit test, component tests. The middle layer is the acceptance test on the API or service level. And the GUI tests are the tests that are doing uh, are done by uh, testing the, the functionality of the system. You can automate all those three tests. You can automate the bottom line by the tools that are available for the, the, for the programmer and the developer in their development uh, environment. Surface test tools are available to the API test and the surface test. And the GUI tests, there are tools like robot framework or the old uh, WinRunner or QTP or whatever tools to the test. And on top there is manual testing, mainly in uh, exploratory testing. And when I look at this one, you see that the coverage of this le of each level is different. On the bottom le the level you have code coverage. And one of the demands man many times in, in HL development is that we want a high code coverage on the units, saying 80% if it's even achievable. Uh, and 
that's meant to be a mean to measure the quality of the system. And I do not fully agree with this because the code coverage says only that all the code is covered, is tested. You don't really say if it's all correct, yes or no. And I can have a lot of units that are technically correct, but are not performing the correct functionality. So I think I would like to focus uh, on function coverage in the acceptance test layer or in requirements coverage in the GUI layer. Now, what you see when you look at the the, the quadrants, the test quadrants, eight test quadrants, uh, and you put them alongside, you see on the bottom there's technology facing supporting the team. It's mainly to build the, the product better. And the top is business facing and to critique the product to say, okay, making the the right product. And that's very important because then you have by this you can see which of the uh which amount of your budget you will spend on all of these levels. Because when you look at this one, which was done by uh Carl, Christian Carlin from Spotify in Sweden, he found out and he said that when you do the unit test and component test, you're only testing about 5% and it is not uh, really meshed, but it's, it's approximate 5% of your business logic. Uh, on the acceptance test layer, you, you get about 25% and on top level, you get even 70%. So the higher the test level, the higher level in the in the triangle, in the pyramid, the more business logic. But also, and this the other hand, the cost of uh, testing is higher on the top. The execution time is high; it takes hours to run the test, uh, where a uh, test on a unit test is only in seconds, uh, and the code coverage is on the bottom level uh, 70%, on the top level only five. So you have to be sure that only unit test is not sufficient, only GUI test is not sufficient. So you should find a means that you spend uh, as little as possible time, uh, have the highest functional and uh, requirements coverage, uh, and then you have to, to calculate the budget you can give on all those levels. But this is very important. We see that the teams tend to focus on the unit test because that's easy to do. Uh, unit test uh, creation and use test in, in, in tools is very simple. The programmer does it, does it itself. He finds his own results. Uh, he corrects it and retests over and over again. You don't need additional testers and you don't need uh, 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 heavy test preparation, but as said, by this 70% of code coverage, you do only a very low percentage of business logic. There are some different, different types of test automation, uh, which I didn't mention yet, but I will in a minute. There is on the bottom level test driven development. And that's a situation where you define your test cases first and then the, create your software according to these test cases. On the acceptance test level, you can do specification by example or acceptance test driven development, which is more or less the same, where the tester defines the test cases and uses test cases as a means to de design the system. So what you see in the, on the picture on the right, the team that uh, looks at the product backlog prioritization uh, will also define the test cases belonging to this product backlog, the items, and these test cases are also the specification that are uh, there for the programmer to build the system. The GUI test we do with keyword driven testing, which is a uh, possibility to separate test cases from the test execution. So a non-test expert will be able to read the test and an automator will aut automate the test and the manual test will be done using exploratory testing where 
besides the test ex expertise, also the experience on the system use is very important and where more intuitively the tests are created and executed. So you can do anything on any level. There are techniques forever, but you have to bear in mind still, when do you do what? Uh, do you use focus on unit test? Do you emphasize on uh, acceptance test? Or do you ex emphasize on GUI test? When I look, uh, have a close look at test driven development, then you see uh, this is F, uh, comes from ex, uh, extreme programming where they did it first times. And you see that programmers are using uh, a tool within their programming environment. Uh, and their demand is that they define the test case first, create a test case, run the test. And there's no there's an error, of course, because the test is, has no code to test. Then you start building the code that should fulfill the test case. And you do this over and over again till the tech test is correct. Then you get the green situation. And if the test is green, you refactor the test. And if it's correct again, then you test it and you have an, an, a correct working system. This is done with very small portions of the, the software. So you take an, uh, a small sentence, a small uh, calculation, you define the test case for this calculation. Next, you uh, define the test code, the code to run this calculation, and then you uh, test it using the predefined test cases. It's ex the experience from this is that you build very uh, good developed and uh, designed software that is error, almost error free and uh, at the first time. The same approach of first defining your test cases, next building your software against these test cases and running your test and see if interesting runs can also be done in acceptance test of development. Testers build and uh, uh, create a test case from the user story that has been defined, for instance, uh, as an, uh, uh, a user of the airline system, I can log in to book an airplane and a uh, flight to California uh, and pay for it. This login process could be defined in test cases. It is correct to log in with the, when he has a correct user ID and password. It is illegal if he has only a password. It's illegal if he has only a user ID. Uh, it's illegal if it's a wrong user ID, and it's illegal if, it, if it's a wrong password. Those five test cases can be defined for a normal login procedure. When I define these test cases in beforehand uh, and discuss it with the, with the product owner, I can find out that I, uh, these are the situations that should be tested and this should be tell, built. So I uh, tell the developer or the developer tells himself by the way will build the software to do the login and use the test cases that are defined with this user story to test the software you can do this manually but you can also build an, uh, a test automation system to do this for you and that brings another thing of uh, advantage of test-driven development and acceptance test-driven development, it is in the end cheaper. At least, at least it uh, leads to a shorter time to market. When you look at normal test, normal test design system or an automation design system, you see it left that the usage stories are defined. During the refinement, people are the product owner and business analyst and testers and, and developers design the details of the user story. And then during development, the test case, testers starts uh, creating a test case. And at the end of the development, the test is run. And the end of the sprint, the demo is run. This is more or less the total time 
And I know that uh, in real agile, agile development, you should be testing continuously, but the experience tells me that normally at the end of a sprint, we do the main test work, or even in later sprint, we do the remaining test work. When you go to the situation where you use TDD and ATDD, then you see that the user, the definition of user stories remains the same. So they got the user stories defined by the product owner and the business analyst or whatever. But during the refinement, we do, don't only refine the user stories into requirements and, and business uh, rules. No, we also define the test cases. In fact, the test cases are an example of the business rules. And during the development stage, during the sprint, the, sprint, uh, the tester starts developing the test cases and the developer starts developing the system. And continuously, every day, again, uh, the tests are run. And every day, the first time, you get a lot of errors, of course, because the tests are there, but the, the, the system is not ready yet. But uh, according to, uh, gradually, the system will be improved and the number of test fails will diminish, diminish. In the end, you can do a demo and you see that you have a faster time to market. The test and development time will take longer because you need more time to develop, and more time to test and more a negotiation on this. The design phase takes a little bit longer, but the test case design phase alongside the sprint is gone. So this is a less effort. And the situation is also that uh, when it's at the start of the sprint, because the test case design is already ready, everyone knows what should be done and how it will be tested. So there's no, uh, it's what they call a, a common understanding of what to be built during the sprint. Also, the test cases uh, are the documentation of the system that will be built. So you'll also, the documentation is always uh, correct and doesn't need to be built or created afterwards. And for our next sprint, if something is changed, the test cases also are um, uh, represented in a regression test. So what did we get in this situation? What you call a paradigm shift. We were not able ever to be involved, become involved in the defining, defining the user needs and requirements. Testers always are always bought in late or asked in late and say, okay, this is a system, please test this for me. So we are now able to shift left and start being involved at the very start of the system development. But there are pitfalls. Uh, there are a lot of situations that you will encounter when you start automating your test. One thing in automation is that you need a stable system. And if the borders of your system that you are test are not clearly defined or are communicating with systems that are not within your control, then you'll have problems if the system outside your control will change. If you test one service, uh, and this service connects to an uh, external or internal system that's already up and running and of which the test data will change every night again, then you have a problem using your system up to date for testing. If you want to test over and over again, you need the same starting situation every over and over again. So if you get not enough, don't get enough state control, you're not able to automate your test properly. Authorization. If you're a test automator, you need to be able to start from a clean situation every time again, at least uh, uh, preferably more than once a day even. So you need to be able to uh, delete files, uh, recreate uh, initial data, etc. If you don't have the authorization, or if you don't have the authorization to log in as one person, 
uh, do a transaction and then log in as another one to approve the transaction, then your automation is probably very difficult. You need to be able to create data that is uh, compliant to your needs during your test. Since you're automating, you're, it's, it's a very binary situation. It's either good or false. Uh, a human who is testing a thing and sees a different uh, outcome of the test, he can interpret that outcome and say, okay, it's still okay because the initial data was not the same. If the system says one and one is two, and the next time it says one and three is two, then you have a problem. So you need to be able to manage your own test data. Uh, same stability of the system again. Uh, if the system not are not stable or not uh, always the same, then you be, need to be able to be as flexible as possible. So if the system consists of a number of, uh, of modules that are uh, not always the same, you need to, be, be, need to build your test automation uh, in such a way that you can follow this configuration of your test. That are the main things that you should think of when you automate your testing. They need to be stable, you need to be able to manage your environment, manage your test data, uh, and have authorization to do things that you otherwise wouldn't have to do. So you should be able to have F any authorization level within an organization if you need it for transactions or whatever things in the test. But there are some trips and, uh, and tricks to do on testing. The thing that I think is most important, uh, use keyword driven testing. That's a quite simple uh, expression. It's not expression it seems, but the main thing is that you, if you automate your test, don't mix up your test data, your test cases with your test execution. So be clear to anyone uh, that what was tested is visible to someone who knows that tests have done or who knows the scenario scenarios that are to be executed uh, and show the how it is done by the to the people who are technical and who can approve that the, the way it was done was okay. So yes, you need to know and need to be sure. You need to test the test automation, the, the white park on the screen. But for the business owner, the right part is not of interest. He doesn't understand it. She doesn't understand it. So keep it as clear as possible to those who should approve your test results. And here you see a number of sessions that start. And then the first column have test keyword which says do this action and the next columns have the, the corresponding data that they need to be used with these actions. Another thing, oops, sorry, my, this one. Uh, stability again, make sure that your automation architecture is flexible. Uh, if your service uh, changes from XML to JSON REST, for instance, as an interface, uh, it shouldn't bother you as a tester uh, on how you test it. You should have a module that take care of the, takes care of this interface so you can uh, replace the binary one and still can run. Same for, the, I've seen systems that run on both GUI and character-based screens uh, for the test itself, it doesn't makes any doesn't make any difference uh, how it's run, as, lo as long as the functionality is the same. That means that you need to build modularity, uh, make modules on architecture, modules of interfaces, module on keywords that are done. Uh, keywords are reused, so build them on high level or low level keywords. That's very important make it possible to change small things in your system without uh, interrupting the complete test. And make it maintainable with that. It's very important. 
and take care that your software is in a configuration and version management system so that if you uh, deploy a system, uh, the system is put in a version management system, I guess. Also, uh, put the testware in the same version management system because the testware is integral part of this software version. And of course, document. Make it main, uh, uh, transferable to other people. I've seen situations that we did a lot of automation uh, and we left because we were external hired people. And if there's no one in the organization over, uh, left, that will <coughs> take over this uh, system and doesn't know enough from the documentation, uh, the system will slowly die, which is a pity and a waste of money. But remember in the end, it's not always wise to automate a test. It's not magic. Uh, it takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of effort to do this. Uh, and you can do a lot of good things, but still always think, is it worth do this first the event investment? Do I gain from it or just do I play because my people like it to do it? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. Uh, and as I mentioned, when I first, the first time I, I saw it, uh, I really like particularly the way you combine different models and different perspectives, like the agile testing quadrants and the cons pyramid, and uh, also uh, combining this with uh, the key one driven testing and uh, ATDD or TDD, and also how to put this into Scrum. <laughs> I, I really like the 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 way you 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 combine all all those views. Uh, we have some time for some questions, um, uh, and and I can start with some of them. And if anyone in the audience uh, want to add uh, more questions in the right panel of the Go to Webinar uh, screen, you can uh, continue adding some questions if you want. Just to mention, uh, just to start with with one question. I want mm -hmm. to know your view on the new wave of automation tools, uh, those that uh, claim that are scriptless. Um, if, if you have any thought about that? Uh, yes, I think I have. Uh, okay. Two things. First of all, uh, what I found out is that scriptless is not always scriptless. Uh, scriptless often means only the basic things uh, but if you need some more fancy uh, uh, situations or difficult situations, you still need to program either in Python or Java or C, which is not a problem, of course, but you have bear in mind that you cannot always uh, solve any pro every problem. Uh, another thing is that those tools tend to mix uh, the test execution logic with the test uh, logic itself. And as I said in a few slides before, uh, that you should be able to show to an, uh, a business person uh, what you tested. And he doesn't really care about how it's tested. So you should present it in a way that it is readable by the end user. Uh, and uh, I think that putting them together into one file in one system, you urge them to uh, to get knowledge of systems that are not do, do, uh, do not belong to the normal daily job, and that's the problem, I guess. So I don't, I'm not very fond of this situation. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And actually, in some projects, we are um, using this type of tools, and um, probably because we have a background in 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 the. Uh, typical automation tools is that why we are trying to implement this uh, separation uh, that you mentioned mm -hmm. in, in some way you know it's like trying to 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 find a way to apply the 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 distinction between the test execution uh, scripting and the test logic uh, mm -hmm. 
in the way we 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 can in the in the tool. But yeah, yes. that's true. I think they are not completely thought in the way you can do this uh, naturally. Yeah, let's let's see, look at uh, actually look at tools as cucumber, where you say you do gherkins, and that is that special day way that you say, given when given the situation when I do this, I expect that to happen. Uh, those people are very fond of this, but they forget that after this gherkin, behind this gherkin, you need to write a full fixture for every sentence, and you have to do this in Java or C or Python, whatever. So you need a real programmer, a real programmer to do this. Yeah, and, and to that's... do it in a, in a good way so you can uh, keep it uh, easy to maintain and, and yeah. all the things that you mentioned. Yeah. Yes, and then uh, the, both the test logic, just the test cases, the, the, the Gherkins are in the Cucumber tool and not you need to exp be able to export them somehow anyway to get them in a readable format outside the tool. Yeah. I have another question from Lisandra. Uh, she wants to know uh, from your perspective, from your experience, what's the best uh, advice for someone who is already doing functional testing, let's call it manual testing, uh, mm -hmm. in order to start with automation? Uh, what you could do, uh, there could be a lot of things to do, but uh, what I used to do is uh, write down the test cases in a keyword in format. Uh, when I go to my slide, I don't know whether it's possible to show my slide again, but I'll, I'll, I'll look at this slide. The slide. Uh, let me but see. Can I, can I get... Do you... give, me, give me one second. This slide, okay. Yes, the slide on the left side, the 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 the, the table on the left side is an Excel table. This way, is mm -hmm. showing uh, the test cases, and you see there's an there's an hierarchy in these test cases. Uh, the, the blue part is, is just only a uh, uh, normal heading thing, but what I do is I initialize the database. I start an application, and I have a test condition or that is that's a requirement that uh, large numbers of accounts will be accepted. That's the requirement and it's not, it's, it's a fake for, of course. And I'd use a test case that I enter 25 accounts and I start enter account. And you can read what's happening here, I guess. You can understand more or less, if you, and especially if you know the, 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 the branch of the, the system you work on, you know what, happened, what happens over there. So if you start writing those te your test cases in this format, then later on, you can start automating this by creating a fixture for each keyword. Okay, so, so the step is you can do it gradually. Start first, start defining your uh, describing your test case in this format, and next create for each uh, keyword uh, a fixture if needed. So we did it this way. Oh, sorry, continue. Yes? continue. No, this, that's the way that we did it. So we created uh, this, what we call a cluster, so scenarios of test. And those scenarios were, uh, uh, were automated later on. We even tested our test cases this way by uh, doing what, what it says. So enter a conference and just go, and you know, uh, you need to know as a tester what it means to, to when you see enter account, then you have to do a lot of test uh, keystrokes, whatever you have to start a program, whatever that's that's behind, and that's what you write as test automation. I can cool. send so, you an, uh, I can, if you know, I can, well, want, I can send you an, uh, an, a paper on this. Oh, that could be awesome uh, because we can also share it with the with yes, the audience sure. uh, along with the with the video. Uh, yeah. So uh, as I understand, the important thing here is to uh, take what you already have uh, mm -hmm. and and start automating uh, using this maybe like a, yes. building yes. a bridge, uh, one step at a time. Okay. Yeah. Don't don't uh, do a full blown automation of it because that's important. That's difficult, and the automation part is not as easy as it seems over here. 
is not just creating you need to create an architecture of uh, of an environment where you have your levels of of, of importance etc so it's not so very simple okay great I, just, I, have, I have another yeah. question here from matthias uh regarding what you mentioned about not automating if there is no time what do you think is the best way of showing the automation roi in short term in short term projects or fix our projects oh uh, that's, <laughs> uh, that's a good question uh the roi is always you have to find a way that's easier said than done that uh you have to, to calculate the the time or the budget needed for development of the test automation and you have to calculate the time and the budget needed for execution of the test and uh, the number of times you want to execute it remember the you're only automating the execution of the test and not nothing else uh, so the test cases are uh, even uh, uh, should I say the test cases are more have to be more precise because you cannot say enter a number between one and ten. Now you have to say each number you want to enter because you need to be predefined or uh, to uh, know the outcome of this test. So your test cases are more precise, take more time to create. And your test automation takes time to create and the only effect is that you only execute your test automatically and that's something you have to bear in mind so in uh if you think and that's what the case this case often in HL development that you have to run the test over and over again because it's after each sprint you do a full integration and you do a full regression test then automation is uh is feasible but if you don't do this, then the ROI is less uh, easy to predict. Am I clear? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. It's something really hard to to show to different yes. stakeholders when, it, even worse when you have little time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. We, we use, yes. Oh. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was saying that we are running out of time, but if you want to run, uh, wrap no, up, no, 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 it's good. That's yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's okay. good. Uh, we have more questions, but uh, what we can do is to follow up on, on, on those ones by by email. Uh, even if you have more questions related to the um, the presentation, you can reach out, and we will try to answer shortly. Yes. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing this great content with us, with our audience. My, uh, my pleasure. It was my, <laughs> really by my pleasure. Sure. Um, again, we will be sharing uh, this, uh, the, the video of the recording by email uh, shortly. Uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today um, and see you soon. <laughs> okay, see you. Bye, thank you very much. Bye-bye.